Ministry Council, and I'm pleased to be welcoming you to our Tuesday night high path avian influenza, avian influenza situational update. Should come up with a better title for next week, maybe. Uh, as always, this uh, series is brought to you through funding through the CAP program. So we're working with OMAFRA to make sure that we're extending all the information and updates around avian influenza in the province on an ongoing basis. So we're gonna be going now until sometime in December. And as always, any of the links, um, hopefully the slide deck that we see tonight is going to be posted on the biosecurity and disease webpage, along with all of the other resources that you need to stay informed. So please take a moment to check that out. And as always, I'm just gonna give a little plug to the emergency planning resource, which is available to anybody online, but Ontario producers, if you're interested in a paper copy, you can sign up through poultryindustrycouncil.ca. So tonight we have an interesting uh, couple of updates and then folks online as always to answer some questions. So first we're gonna hear from Dr. Heather McClinchy, who's gonna talk about the human impacts of avian influenza which is a whole complicated set of information that she's gonna break down and make really easy to understand for us. And then we're gonna hear, I'm not sure what Al's talk is about necessarily, but it's a bit of a variety show and it's gonna be everything that you wanted to hear about. Um, and then of course, we've got our friends from CFIA and from Environment Canada to talk about anything else that we need questions wise. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Heather. Uh, so good evening, my name is Dr. Heather McClinchy. I'm the public health veterinarian at the Ontario Ministry of Health. Uh, I have a really cool job. I, my job is to uh, help uh, navigate through um, any of the zoonotic diseases uh, in, uh, in Ontario. So anytime we have um, diseases that affect both people and animals, um, I get called in to, um, to help out. So tonight I'm going to be speaking about the human health implications of avian influenza. Uh, in terms of what we know, what we don't know, and, and what um, steps you can take uh, to protect yourself. So influenza viruses are um, infectious microbes that cannot re replicate outside of a host. So this is different than bacteria because some bacteria can actually divide once they're outside of a host, but viruses can. Um, and vir but viruses can remain uh, viable outside of the body, uh, depending on um, the environmental conditions. There are four types of flu viruses, uh, A, B, C, and D. And avian influenza is a type A virus known to infect birds and mammals, including humans. And it's really only influenza type A viruses that have been known to cause pandemics. Influenza viruses are further classified based on the protein structure on the outside of them. So they've got hemagglutinin, which is the H uh, protein designation, which um, on the picture in the corner there is in blue, and the neuroamidase, uh, known as the N protein, which is in red. Most, most of the avian influenza virus that's circulating right now is H5N1. This should sound a little bit familiar. Although uh, just last month in Montana, they did have a case of H5N4. So we'll have to see whether or not that continues to be, um, uh, to be circulating. The kind of uh, scary thing about influenza is it likes to change its structure frequently. So it can do this in two ways, either slowly as antigenic drift or quickly as antigenic shift. And I'll talk about that more in just a second. So in the past uh, year, there have been three reported cases of H5N1 in people. The first was in England in December of 2021. And this was a gentleman who had um, ducks in his house with him uh, and his ducks got sick and, and he also became sick. The second was in 22, this was uh, a prisoner who was hired to help depopulate a commercial poultry farm. And then the third case was uh, in Spain uh, last month. Um, and that person, um, as with the uh, England case, they were asymptomatic, meaning they didn't show clinical signs. Um, and the uh, case in the United States, he was mildly ill and all three uh, recovered fully. 
So you might be wondering, so like, what's what's the big deal um, with uh, with influenza? Well, the, the big deal is that viruses like influenza can change rapidly um, through antigenic shift. So there's really no trusting them. Uh, influenza a viruses in the past have caused pandemics like the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Um, so the Centers for Disease Control in the United States currently considers H5N1 to be of low to intermediate risk for uh, causing a pandemic. So certainly of concern, but not of uh, some of the highest concern um, uh, variants of uh, influenza that we've seen. Testing for influenza is critical. We, it's critical we catch these cases and it's critical that we understand uh, what changes are happening uh, to the structure of this, this virus. And as you may or may not have heard, in the past six months or so, we're starting to see some mammalian adaptations to our currently circulating H5N1. We've had seen cases in foxes, raccoons, skunks, seals, uh, penguins, porpoises and dolphins, a black bear in Quebec, and now recently in mink. So this virus is starting to become more adapt to uh, our mammalian tissues, which, which means that there might be more risk for people. So in terms of protecting yourself, uh, what are we talking about? Well, we're, we're uh, assuming this from other influenza viruses that it's going to be spread by airborne transmission respiratory droplets and, and poop to mouth. Um, and those are thought to be our most uh, significant risks. Um, when determining though what you need in terms of personal protective equipment, I really have to stress, it's about the context of your exposure. Live animals are going to have far more risk associated than with dead animals. Sick animals are going to be more of risk than healthy animals. We've got to think about um, the species. So certain birds, certain mammals are going to be more uh, prone to, to get catching avian influenza than others. So we have to think about that. We have to think about how close we're getting to our birds and what it is we're doing to them and with them and whether or not we're indoors or out. And a lot of this comes from the same sort of thought processes with COVID. Um, you know, being outdoors can help reduce our risk. Being indoors in confined places with lots of birds is, is a higher risk. So you might need a mask. You might need an N95 mask. You might need eye protection, goggles, a face mask. You might need gloves. You might need boot covers or, or, a, or a hazmat suit, depending on the type of situation you're in. But for um, the majority of, of healthy bird interactions, it's probably not. Um, not required. When we're near birds and we're using personal protective equipment uh, that's intended for single use, such as gloves and masks, uh, please use them as single use and don't reuse them. It's, uh, it's not a good idea in case those birds are, um, are infected. If you have clothing, uh, it needs to be washed in hot water and detergent, um, and that should be enough to kill any virus that's on your clothing. If you see sick bird or mammal, um, it's best to call your local municipality or rehabilitation center and don't attempt to care for it yourself. Um, I think we can all speak to, um, to knowing of cases uh, where people have gone to extraordinary measures uh, to try and, and uh, resuscitate or care for uh, sick animals that have turned out to be avian influenza positive, and it's just not worth putting yourself at that risk. Let, them, let the professionals do it. If you do get a dead bird, say, and you're, um, you're submitting it to the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative for testing, um, do some sensible things like use a shovel so that you don't have to touch it. Uh, and then put it, pick it up and put it uh, with your shovel and put it into a double bag so that you don't have that, uh, that close direct contact. The Ministry of Health has published uh, recommendations, which are not only useful for people in the poultry industry and those that are uh, working with susceptible species, but I think it's uh, can be used by anyone. Um, and the PDF link is in, in my presentation, which will be shared afterwards. So please check that out. It talks about risk and it talks about determining the personal protective equipment that you sh should be wearing, depending on the context of your exposure. 
So other things we can do to protect ourselves. If you are uh, near a known uh, case of um, avian influenza, so you've been in close contact, especially without PPE, and you're at high risk of complications for influenza, you should speak to your physician about whether or not antiviral therapy is appropriate for your situation. We need to keep pets away from sick and dead birds. A lot of the mammals, not all, but a lot of the mammals that were that have been infected with avian influenza have gotten infected because they have eaten uh, dead birds uh, that were infected. Um, for reasons other than just avian influenza, it's really not a good idea to kiss or cuddle your birds, especially when we're talking about poultry. Um, the Public Health Agency of Canada has a really nice website if you are a hunter. Um, and it has uh, information on, on proper cooking of, of your meat, and it also has some sensible precautions that you should be taking. Uh, avian influenza is not considered a foodborne disease, but it is uh, it, it has the potential to be if you're if you're eating raw meat or your animals are eating whole carcasses. So um, so do just bear that in mind. Proper cooking is key. And if you'll let me get on my soapbox for just a moment, it really is important that you get your seasonal influenza vaccine, especially if you're around birds. It's really important that we um, prevent people from getting dual viral infections. So that's infection with multiple uh, types of influenza at the same time. When we talk about this antigenic shifting, this fast changes, that's the way it can happen. Uh, in, in somebody being a melting pot. So our seasonal influenza vaccine can reduce the chance of us getting sick. And if we do get sick, it, it lessens the clinical symptoms, it lessens the infectivity period. Uh, and so um, that can be really helpful. And then uh, needless to say, it is really important that we don't spread flu to family members, especially those that are vulnerable to children, elderly or anybody with underlying health issues. Um, the, the, you know, speaking to COVID back, COVID, the COVID situation, a lot of the really bad COVID variants started out in patients who were immunocompromised, uh, where their, um, where their immune systems uh, allowed uh, for mutations to occur. So really preventing disease is, is really the best thing we can do. If you do get sick with influenza virus, you're typically going to get sick within one to four days after exposure. And during that uh, incubation period, you can infect other people. So I'm sure I don't need to go through this list of what it looks like when you get in the influenza virus, because anybody who's had it, uh, it's, it's really awful. Uh, you're going to feel pretty crappy for, uh, for some period of time until you recover. Um, so yeah, fever, chills, cough, all that kind of stuff, not so, not so much fun. What do you do if you do get the flu? If you are uh, exposed to poultry, if you are exposed to mammals, especially if you are concerned that they may have had avian influenza, it is extremely important that you speak to your primary health care provider and let them know that information. Public Health Ontario is doing testing. It's, uh, it's testing for uh, multiplex respiratory COVID PCR and avian influenza A or influenza A testing um, by PCR. They're doing that for uh, people that are exposed to birds uh, and who are symptomatic. If your doctor doesn't know about this testing, they can uh, get this information through their local public health unit. Or if you have questions, your local public health unit should also be able to provide you with, um, with information. If you're sick, stay at home and self-isolate. We don't really want you spreading it to others. And uh, testing of asymptomatic individuals uh, is possible, but uh, is really done on a case-by-case -case basis um, under exceptional circumstances. So that's what I have to share about avian influenza. Uh, I'm not sure if we're gonna take questions now or whether we're gonna hold them to the end. I think we're gonna just hold on to them if that's okay. I see we've got a few piling up, so it'll give you a second to ponder them maybe. Okay. Now we're gonna have Al Dam do his update. Thanks, Heather. That was great. 
Hey, hello everyone again. Uh, I'm gonna just pull up my screen here so you guys can see what I am looking at and uh, let's grip it and rip it. So, okay. So once again, I'm Al Dam, your poultry specialist with MAFRA. I deal with all things feathers in this province and uh, can't go one talk without doing a bit of a promo for the uh, PIC um, biosecurity and disease webpage. So this is how you guys registered in the first place. We still have lots of resources on here and we're piling more on all the time. The late, latest ones were the preventing and managing conflicts with birds and preventing conflicts with wildlife from uh, our folks at MMF. But uh, one of the things I wanted to show you tonight was the new or the updated map from CFIA. Uh, I know Kim's on here and she can jump on if I've missed anything, but this is what we're dealing with currently. Um, we've got a commercial operation down uh, toward uh, Waterloo area that uh, is uh, been depopulated and, and working through some of our sites from before our walking through that and our other cluster is up in the Ottawa area. Uh, some of these are related to another, others, some of them aren't, but uh, looking back at these, almost all of them have been small flock uh, and they pretty much have been associated with birds having access to outdoor um, wildlife and uh, and wild birds. But once again, this is not a disease of the commercial industry. Uh, otherwise, we have a whole lot more commercial positive. That being said, we're, we're kind of waiting for the shoe to drop because uh, Quebec has seen a lot of positives in the last little while and they've been small flock and uh, commercial. And if I, if I can zoom out here a little bit, um, Western Canada still has oodles of positives and we're still waiting um, and they don't I keep hoping they're going to slow down but we still see one or two positives still um, almost every day from across the country so the risk is still there uh, and I'm sure uh, Chris can back me up on this from the wild bird side that we still have lots of uh, wild bird out there that are potentially positive now one of the things I did want to talk about tonight though is what we're dealing with in terms of potential vectors for these to get into your operation and one of the big ones I'm concerned about this fall is uh, rodents and I'm concerned more about to be honest well both both rats and mice uh, we've had a great year for rodent production out in, in the summer and as the temperature gets colder and it will get colder into next week uh, and we've had some snow already in some parts of the province, they'll be looking for warm places to overwinter. And that's probably going to be our, some of our, our coops and barns. And yes, we want to control them because they are uh, one of the largest causes of fires in rural areas, both in barns and in houses, because they chew all the time. They spoil feed. But they are, and this is the Part that I wanted to show you guys between rats and mice, uh, and I really should change this because what to remember is is that rats live outside the barn, and they come in, uh, and they need a hole the size I'm going to say a quarter because some people have thumbs, and a mice a mouse only needs the hole the size of a dime to get into your coop or your barn. So unless you can block off all those potential places where mice and rats can get in, uh, you're going to be left dealing with traps or baits. And the baiting of, of rodents is going to be of particular concern this fall because there's such a high presence of rodents out there. And once again, I'm more concerned about rats because they go in and out of the barn, which means they could be getting on that dead goose coming into your barn to look for grain or water. So keep up with your with your baiting. If you're not doing anything for rodent control, uh, you might want to start looking at it. This fact sheet is on our OMAFRA page. We actually have a rodent control fact sheet that I wrote a number of years ago that lists all of this. You can just go rodent control OMAFRA and this will pull up. And here's the uh, here's the uh, charts that I was talking about, uh, what to look for, visual sites. Once again, and the old wives tale is true, if you're seeing rodents during the day, that means the, the rodent pressure is so high in your barn that because they are nocturnal animals. If you see rodents during the day, that means you've got a 
really horrendous uh, rodent control problem. One of the things I do like to mention is that uh, a lot of folks say, oh, I'll just get a cat. Uh, cats may be great uh, mousers, but they won't deal with a high infestation very well. And in some cases, uh, cats can actually bring diseases uh, into your also. So there are different things that we can look at, live traps, bait, um, and these things are gonna be very useful if used properly. Uh, you wanna, you can go buy war for a Canadian tire and a lot of those woods will just laugh at you because there's a lot of resistance issues with some of our, our baits. So look at uh, some of the stronger products. You don't want something that'll kill a rat or a mouse right away. You want it to uh, eat the bait, go back to its nest, dies there. If the rodent dies in the nest, other rodents won't move in and take over that nest. So that is the issue. We often say we want you guys to trap house because you want to actually get the rodents uh, in our barns we usually bait because we can we can deal with that um, and part of baiting if you're baiting is to look at a couple of things one is the bait fresh because if it gets moldy mice and rats won't eat it and two to monitor these bait stations to make sure that if the road if the rodenticide is disappearing quickly you want to refresh it constantly because that means there's a lot of pressure and they're eating a lot of that bait. So you need to actually uh, rebate to make sure you get full effect. If you're not monitoring any of that, you just don't know how bad the pressure is. Um, some of our IPs we're dealing with have horrendous road control problems, which lead to challenges with cleaning and disinfection. Uh, and when I say some of our IPs, those are our small flock IPs. So it, you may not realize how bad it is until you're actually starting to look. And once the uh, feed and birds are gone from an area, that's when you see the rodent pressures amp up pretty high. Rodents can also do all sorts of things like ruin the insulation in your walls. Um, I've got stories of folks that uh, had rodents kill birds and cache them uh, in the wall. Um, so you end up having a wall with insulation that's fallen down and tons of baby chicks in the wall. Baby chicks don't give good insulative quality. So we found this because in January when it's minus 20, we saw frost on the wall uh, from where the insulation was gone and we peeled back plywood. All these little bones trickled out from the uh, baby chicks that the rats killed. So whether it's your small flock or a commercial operation or whatever, uh, the rodents can be there and they can be a potential vector for raven influenza. So anyways, if you're looking for rodent information, you can just do rodent control of MAFRA and both this fact sheet, uh, this web page, and this rodent control fact sheet will come up. Uh, uh, finally, can you just mention, sorry, can you just mention about pesticides and if there's any limitations as far as needing a license for some? Yeah, so for some of the pesticides you can get, uh, I can't remember the classifications off the top, it's probably in here. Um, as a homeowner, you've only got access to certain pesticides, um, fairly benign like warfarin and low dose. Uh, to get, if you have a really bad rodent control program, problem and you don't have a grower pesticide safety license, uh, it might be better to get a exterminator to come in because they have access to some of the stronger rodenticides and the newer classifications of rodenticides that can be uh, single use kill or multi use kill depending upon what you're looking at. Um, if you're looking at, at that, um, you, you know, and, and you've not done this before, I would suggest you go to at a pest control company to deal with your the road control problem. Like I said, it's as it gets colder. The rats and mice are looking for a warm place and your poultry, your poultry barn or your, your coop can be one of those things that is just perfect for them. Um, you can get things like traps. Uh, I think glue boards are coming out of, or they're, we're starting to disappear. Here we go. Yeah, here's some of the classifications we talked about. So uh, some of these, a warfarin is a fairly low dose you can buy at the store, but it doesn't work that great. Um, some of these other products, come in higher 
doses. One of the things when we look at at the um, at the types of of bait stations you have is they have to be lockable and make sure that we don't have non-target um, species eat the bait. So when I say non-target, I mean your cats, your dogs, and your kids. So that's part of the challenge we have with uh, with baits. Do it properly, use them well, monitor them often. Uh, and then depending upon where you are, sometimes your snap traps might be the way to go. Mice will, will always come back to a trap and keep getting trapped over and over again. Um, rats tend to be very wary of, of snap traps. So if you get one, it'll be once in a blue moon. And a mouse trap will not work for a rat. You need the big rat trap for that. Okay, uh, finally, if I haven't missed anything there, actually, uh, the order, the minister's order is still in effect. Uh, as you guys were aware, it was extended to November 21st. Uh, which is in three weeks. Um, hopefully we're on top of the challenges we've got with, with small flocks and commercial birds, but this order can be extended. So at the point, the end date is November 21st. If things uh, go sideways on us in the next couple of weeks, there's a good chance that'll be extended. I know it makes it really hard for planning stuff, whether it's uh, shows or events, um, but we are in a in a high risk risk scenario right now. I think with that, I think I'm done my rant. Do we want to try taking a crack at some of the questions, or is there anyone else? Nope, that's good. That uh, question about pesticides. There are a couple of questions around that, but we'll get to them in a second. So I'll just uh, if you want to stop sharing your screen. Yeah, there we go. If we can get our uh, question answer contributors back on, Chris and Cassandra and Heather, that would be awesome. Okay, so the first question is about um, bat research. And so the question is, bat scientists encourage people to do citizen science and build or buy bat boxes and install and monitor them. Do bats get AI or carry and transmit it? If so, is it better for small flock people and commercial poultry not to put up any bat boxes for now? Heather, do you want me to take a first go at this one? And yeah, sure, okay. go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one thing, just to be clear, bats aren't birds. Um, so the risk of a bat contracting avian influenza is probably um, as as low as any other mammal that doesn't consume sick or dead birds. So I think it's probably low risk. Um, but one thing, and I, I, I did a little research while, while uh, Al was talking, sorry Al, um, because I wanted, to, I wanted to get this answer right. And, and I wondered about whether or not birds ever use bat houses. And, and the answer is yes. So there's a study in England, it's the only study I could find, but 40% of bat houses were used by passerins, so songbirds. Now, passerins are generally thought to be low risk, lower risk than say waterfowl for transmitting avian influenza. But it, like we've been harping for the last 10 months, all birds can have it. So it's not no risk. So um, what I would say that is it, if people, I think putting up bat houses is a great thing. I would put it away from poultry um, if you can. And if you can't, then I would consider not not putting it up. It's low risk and I, I maybe get some letters from bat people, but um, I, I don't think it's no risk. And I just think right now, if you have commercial poultry or even backyard flocks, it's, it's just not worth it. So that, that's my uh, answer. And I'm, I'm not a bat expert by any means. Well said, Chris. I, I concur. Yeah, okay, super, thank you. Thank you. Um, so this question is about whether or not the virus is deadly in, mammal, in mammals, such as cats and dogs, and do, is there any limitation in which mammals, even large mammals like cows, getting it? Uh, so I, we can maybe start, is that, is that okay? Yeah, go ahead, anyone. Uh, yeah, so we've had some, uh, some uh, mammals get uh, influenza. Uh, typically so far, uh, dogs, have carried different strains of influenza than the one that's circulating. We don't know that uh, H5N1, at least the one we've got right now, 
uh, can infect them. But I think uh, knowing that the species range seems to be ever increasing, uh, we're getting into hunting season and potentially uh, more dogs having access to carcasses. I, I don't think I'm confident saying that there's no risk. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, it's wise to be sensible. There have been some large mammals uh, that have been infected with H5N1 that have died um, from this. So I don't think size uh, uh, necessarily is protective um, against this disease. Uh, we do not know of uh, livestock, uh, of cattle. <laughs> I should be careful with this. We are not, uh, we don't know that there's any infectivity uh, ever being documented in cattle. If, if, I, if I can just add something to Heather's answer, I, I think regard, uh, regarding um, risk to like hunting dogs, for example, um, the mammals that we've seen test positive and, and succumb to the virus so far, I, I believe have, are all species that can uh, realistically consume sick or dead birds. Um, so a cow, for example, I mean, I've, I've heard of uh, ruminants eating songbird nests and that sort of thing, but that, that's pretty, pretty rare, pretty low risk. Um, but for hunting dogs, I, if you have a retriever that, that's known to tear into birds, that's something that you maybe want to prevent. I think you probably, being a hunter, that if you have a dog tearing into your bird, you want to prevent that anyhow. But that at this point, that that's where it's higher risk. I think when when they tear into a carcass and they're breathing in um, the secretions from that animal, I think that's maybe what what put them puts them at a little higher risk than um, just retrieving uh, a bird, for example. I was going to throw my two cents in. So we've had had some of the larger feline species like um, tigers to come do it when they were being fed dead chickens that had AI. This happened in some zoos in Asia. Uh, and when you look at some of the species that we've had test positive in Ontario, there are canid species, right? With like foxes. Uh, so there is not that much of a genetic difference between a fox and a domestic dog. Uh, so it's more a function of are they exposed to the virus? And as Chris Sharp said the other day, like if, if they're, if they're launching into a carcass and they're breathing in this virus, uh, that is going to be one of your higher risk species. Sorry, higher risk events that could happen where, where they can spread. Thanks. Uh, so we just have a question from someone who's uh, who has a, a falconry bird. How can one, with in consideration of the minister's order restricting uh, movement of birds, how can someone travel to have their bird cared for by a veterinarian? So the minister's order does not apply for birds that are going to for veterinary care. So that okay. is not a challenge. I think we've had some challenges, or we've had some discussions about um, overwintering of birds, and and uh, we're getting some answers back on that. I, I don't think that would apply for your your falcon, though. Okay, that's a good clarification. Um, so just a question around the thinking behind the limitations of poultry or poultry byproduct movement permits. How does that help contain the infection, uh, the spread of infection, especially the kind of permit where it's a little bit self-serve to some degree? I can take a stab at this one, guys, since movement control is kind of my, my game here at CFIA. Yeah. Uh, normal movement or our specific movement permits, there are definitely restrictions as far as testing or flock health that we look at prior to issuing those. So we are making sure healthy birds are moving. In the case where you're talking about the kind you print off the website, um, we have transitioned with a new event response plan to a traceable general permit. So that permit must be submitted to us um, prior to you printing it. We do have a copy of it. Included in that permit are a set of biosecurity conditions that must be adhered to. Should we ever find uh, an AI event where movement had occurred prior, we will be able to go back, trace the movement, see where the birds came from and backtrack and maybe help stop spread the, the event further from there. All right, that's very clear. Thank you, Cassandra. This is a question just clarifying uh, the difference between a commercial security zone and a primary control zone and an infected commercial zone. Andrew, that sounds like a you question. Yeah, I think that's back to me again. 
Um, so just to talk first about a primary control zone, a pr primary control zone is put in place as soon as an IP is deemed to be poultry. Um, there are infected premises that are deemed non-poultry based on the classification. No primary control zone is put in place there. When a primary control zone is put in place, it consists of two zones within one, a restricted zone and an infected zone. The infected zone is from out to three kilometers and the restricted zone is from the three to 10 kilometer um, range. Once activities at the IP have started and um, the viral load has been decreased, we have determined that we can transition from our infected and restricted zones into a commercial security zone. And this is a new change. Those in the spring, we did not have that zone here in Ontario. Um, we stayed with infected and restricted zones the entire time. Once you moved into a security zone, that is when we can lessen the permit requirements because we feel that the, the risk of transmission is lower at that time due to the fact that things have been contained on the infected premise. And last week, um, we shared a visual of the different sort of processes, if this, then this, if this, then how long things might take. So just feel free to check out the CFIA website. It's got all the definitions and different logic models and stuff like that. Uh, so there's a question about which and how many provinces currently have a prov province-wide ban on show sales and movements. I'll take a stab at that one. I, I think it's just currently on Ontario, Saskatchewan, and BC. I haven't heard in the last week if anyone else has pulled anything up or not. Uh, we can double check on that, but that's and that can change day to day, right? Depending upon the severity of, of the situation. So, anyways, at, at this point, all I'm aware of, and I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone of any knowledge, it's three. Yeah, and I suspect if you go on the, the individual ministry websites for agriculture in each province, probably we could figure that out. Yeah. If you were so inclined. Um, so are private one-to-one -one poultry sales or purchases allowed? Well, I get this a lot, and uh, technically they are allowed, but uh, I guess the question, and I, and I brought this up a couple of weeks ago, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, you can be a spreader event as well as anyone else. So, and and I've struggled with this because I've got some of the exhibition folks I deal with have said, we're not selling anything. We're just like our overstock, we're gonna get rid of, we're gonna euthanize them and, and compost them and put them in our, you know, deal with them as dead stock because they just don't wanna have a risk and you even wanna be associated. So, you know, Cassandra's here, if anything happens and you've been known to sell birds and it's on your site, guess what? <laughs> Everyone you've sold to is going to get a call from Sandra or someone much more <laughs> probably not as pleasant as Cassandra to figure out what's going on with those birds. Because that traceback is a pretty intense operation that CFI does once we have an IP. Okay, thank you. So here's just a follow-up question about uh, different rodent controls and using different poisons. So how do we manage that interaction between things that eat dead things who've been um, killed by some kind of poison? So this comes into the how the baits are designed and used. So you know I've had folks ask me, well, what about me making my own concoction of bait? Well, I'm sure that would go over well. Um, and I've heard all the gory recipes that people have used that they found on the interweb. Um, our baits are designed to not kill an animal within five steps of it eating it, right? We want that that rodent to go back to its nest. If it feels awful, it'll go back, take a drink, go back to its nest to rest, and that's where it dies. So it's, it's not accessible to other predators. Uh, you use something really powerful that drops within five feet of where it, it's eaten that, that rodent aside. Then yeah, we will have that problem with non-target species uh, eating the product or eating eating that carcass that's consumed that uh, that poison. So that's some of the challenges or some of the discussions we have when it comes to non-target species. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm more concerned about the non-target species eating the bait than I am the worms themselves. But that's if the bait is used properly. Okay. Did you have some add, Chris? No, no, I don't. Sorry. 
No, no problem. Okay, so another question on that note, are there recommended alternatives or dosages to warfarin for rodent control in the cases where birds of prey could predate poisoned rodents and be negatively affected? Uh, no. If the you're dose not is using, the dose. If you're not using it at the proper dose, you're not gonna get the required kill and you're just gonna actually amplify the resistance opportunity uh, in that population. For that just like with our insect control products and whatnot if you're if you're cutting the dose or you're mixing it um and to be honest in some rodent populations they eat warfarin like it's candy yeah and so, so is that a case of resistance to populations yeah, or why absolutely is it is yeah because it's been used so much mm -hmm. uh that's why if you're putting warfarin out and it's disappearing and you see no change in your rodent population it might be worth getting uh, if you don't have a for pesticide safety license, it might be worth getting a professional exterminator company to come in and take a look. And, and to be honest, they can do an evaluation of your of your site and go, okay, how, how much of a risk do you have here? And they can do like a deep dive into where you are and what you have and what kind of program they need to start for you. Hmm. So in the case, I'm just thinking about the small flock context, like if you have a big commercial barn, obviously it's presumably a relatively enclosed system. How might someone manage that in a slightly more porous housing situation? Well, once again, it's gonna be about hiding the food sources, right? So are you storing your feed in the bag at the side of the corner or are you putting it in a steel garbage can or an old freezer, right? So whatever attractants you have that will bring rodents to your place and and if uh, we can do a plug now for the small flock course that we do in March, Ashley, right? Like when I say we, it's CFC and myself, you can get things like um, something called a trendle feeder that is rodent proof that'll only open when a bird sits on it and it actually opens the feeder and, and uh, rodents won't have access to the poultry feed with this trendle feeder. Uh, so that's some of the things you're going to need to look for. But to be honest, like you can you can find the uh, two marks, the oils, and the droppings, and you know you've got a problem. Okay. Thanks. So I just have a little. Um, so with the prevalence of the virus, does the CFIA plan to monitor backyard flocks more or differently? I guess I can speak to this. Um, we will follow up on any backyard flocks that we are alerted of mortalities that exist. Um, when a call comes into us that something has increased mortality or some sick birds at it, we definitely do a field epidemiology risk assessment on them. Um, and if we feel testing is warranted, we will send out testing to every small flock that we feel um, warrants that, that follow up. Can I do a rant? <laughs> rant I, away. We need, need to do a rant. Um, so I've heard in the last few weeks there has been a lot of shoot, shovel, and shut up going on out there in the small flock industry. Um, that being what said, what do you mean by that now? What do you mean by that? So shoot, shovel, and shut up. So oh, all my birds are dead, and I'll make up some reason why they're dead. Like a mink got them when pretty sure AI has gotten them, and you're just trying to bury. So. I've heard of folks just burying carcasses and doing that. And I guess this is going back to the C and D protocols that CFI has when we have an infected premise. You're not just dealing with infected carcasses and going, we're done, right? We're dealing with infected material, which includes feed, manure, um, the dead stock that can harbor the virus. So just killing your birds and burying them and then repopulating in a couple of weeks, especially in the colder weather, means guess what? Those birds are going to die die too if you have it. So just get rid of your birds and assuming that the disease is gone once the birds are dead is a fallacy. So, you know, yeah, we know there's going to be shoot, shovel, and shut up that happens out there. And are you going to get rid of that the disease? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, are you going to be the guy that keeps spreading this disease throughout the small flock community when you keep getting more birds and they're dying and you've gotten people coming over to buy birds from you? Right. 
we know CFI isn't getting every case, and we know that we're not getting every dead bird, uh, dead wild bird going to Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. So we're just going on on what we see and what people are reporting. Okay, so question, um, oh, Heather. Yeah, and I'm just gonna jump in there and also say, it's, you know, if you don't uh, get an opportunity to do a proper cleaning and disinfecting of your property, you're exposing yourself, your other animals, it's just not worth it. Mm. Especially now, like now might not be a flock expansion moment over the next little while, just until we see how AI kind of transpires over the next while. Uh, so a question about bats. What is the benefit of the bat houses and why why are people doing that? Um, so again, I, I'm far from a bat expert, um, but there's some benefits to having bats around. They're, they're good, they're aerial insectivores, so they're, they're eating insects some of which including mosquitoes are are pests for people um they're good pollinators um so that's an added benefit and to be honest um bats have kind of a bad rap and have have been uh persecuted over the years and and a lot of bat populations are in trouble so putting up bat houses and giving them a safe place to roost that that's desirable for them because they they historically relied on tree cavities and, and people love nothing more than to cut down old trees. And so we don't have as many cavities around as, as we maybe used to. And so it's nice to have them around. It's a little bit of a stewardship thing. So I guess for those reasons, those are sort of the benefits and why people might want to consider a bat house, but not beside their poultry barn. Um. So there's a question about the vaccination situation. So when might we get a vaccine available in the US or in Canada and in what situations might that be appropriate? Not anytime soon. We are hoping to, to have vaccine developed. Uh, we, we know there's a number of companies both in Europe and the US that are looking at uh, an H5N1 vaccine. As Lucy has mentioned in other other weeks, uh, we do have an even influenza vaccine that is currently available, but it doesn't work that well on this H5N1 variant. So there's not much point in vaccinating for that, let alone the fact that we do have some trade restrictions. And we have actually spoken with some of the two communities with CFA in regards to whether or not using um, an approved even influenza vaccine in collections that are very rare or endangered, like at a zoo. Uh, how that would or would not, and would not impact our trade uh, with other countries, because we're not really putting that vaccine into the food system uh, in the case of a zoo or birds that aren't in the, in the food chain. But yeah, when will it be available? Don't know. I think Lucy had mentioned at some point, maybe later on in 2023, but uh, the fact that people are saying, oh, don't worry about it, we'll have a vaccine soon, I don't think that's a great way to make Sandra's job any easier at CFA <laughs> because you're letting your guard down just means we'll probably have more opportunity for, for infections and Cassandra being busy. Okay. Uh, so we have a question for Chris. Last week you showed a map of my, the migratory bird route. Has the route of migra migratory birds changed in recent years? And how have things changed in relation to climate change? Yeah, uh, so I, I'm, I guess I don't really know what is meant by recent years, but over the last couple decades, and, and there's, there's definitely been change in migration routes of, of migratory birds. Um, changes to agricultural practices have resulted in more reliable food sources on, on different, in different regions. And as, as a result, many waterfowl species, for example, have changed their movement patterns to, to, to key in on those uh, agricultural resources. Uh, climate change is having all sorts of influences on, on migratory birds. As far as like a change in migratory pathway or, or distribution, I think one, one key component in Ontario anyhow is, is changes to overwintering distribution. So um, historically, 
I mean, winters were harsher in, in Southern Ontario and, and more birds had to, had to leave. Um, now, um, a, a fairly significant proportion of many uh, waterfowl populations are staying in the Great Lakes Basin over winter. Um, and those that are able to take advantage of agricultural uh, food subsidies are, are, are even better off. So I, I think that there definitely has been changes in, in distribution over the years. Um, as far as the link between AI and, and climate change, I, I, I don't think that that's a necessarily a driving factor in this current outbreak, but I, 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 there's probably better people to ask that question than, than me. Um, so we just have a question about using uh, falcons for bird abatement. Is there a restriction in doing so in hot spots? I'm not sure if from the minister's order. I, I think this is what this person's asking. Um, have not heard about that because it's is it a commingling event? Not sure. Uh, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. Are, are falcons under? a agriculture permit, not with CWS. No, they're not. So they're not federally uh, regulated. They're provincially regulated, but, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know what implications the order has. Well, one, one thing I would kind of speak to is I would, I would consider Southern Ontario to be a hot spot. I think, I think we've, we've had virus detected from Cornwall to Windsor um, in wild birds and, and, and in well, for not poultry exactly, but throughout Ontario, we've had poultry detections. So I, I think it's safe to assume that the virus is all over Southern Ontario. I think one key thing is um, regarding the safety of your falcons is try, try not to let them eat it. We know that falcons are or raptors are very susceptible to the virus and birds don't, wild birds don't have to be symptomatic in order to shed virus. So if, if you're out with your falcon and you're, you're, hunt, you're catching mallard ducks, for example, mallard ducks have been detected with avian influenza and the, the, the ducks appear perfectly healthy. So um, I would be very cautious if I, if I had a falcon and was using it for hunting or bird abatement. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so here's a question about um, how might you bring um, oh, yeah, your... Sorry, oh, jump in? oh, sorry, Heather. Yeah. Sorry, I, my question, I just, because I interpreted the question a little bit differently. Uh, are they, uh, do you require a permit to move in, move a falcon into a primary control zone at all, Cassandra? Sorry, guys, I was just looking up their stuff. Um, we permit poultry products, and if falcon if a falcon is deemed a wild um, animal, then we would not be permitting falcons at this time. Uh, okay, so the question is, what if a vet has multiple birds on their site, and you need to take your bird to their operation to get looked at? I'm not sure, Al, if you want to. Yeah, that one. So that one's that's going to come back down to does the uh, veterinarian have proper quarantine and biosecurity procedures in place, right? So uh, in cases where we've had this, let's just take, take an example of a um, wild bird rehabber, because I think we've had some of those come up, Chris, in the, in the across the country where an AI positive bird has been brought to a rehab facility. If they've got good quarantine facilities, then that's not an issue. But if, if they don't good by security protocols, uh, the whole facility is at risk of depopulation potentially, whether they've got commercial poultry there or, or other wild birds. Yeah, I guess yeah. I'd, I'm not sure if they're talking about if the context of that question is in, in, in relation to the minister's order and commingling, if that's the concern or, or um, because there, I don't know if vets are an exemption under the commingling of the ministerial order or not, but um, 
I don't know, maybe we could get back to the group on with that information on what the exemptions are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know on a previous session, we had a veterinarian say like, don't bring like visibly sick birds to my property, like let's talk over the phone and create a plan. So maybe that's, maybe it's a more of a situational thing where you should check in with your vet before deciding to bring it in. And that would be a great point of questioning to say like, how are we keeping each other safe from uh, any potential infections or anything? So we just have a question about where can we find more information about what's meant by non-poultry? I'm not sure, Cassandra, if you're able to field that. Um, I would actually send you guys back to, I think it was last week's um, webinar. I think Lucy put up the screen, a uh, screenshot that has a copy of it. I unfortunately don't have a digital copy of it quickly here to get um, in time. I was trying to find it before you got to this question. Um, non Poultry, it all has to do around with the birds moving on and off the property and having contact with other commercial premise. So those are kind of the two triggers. Um, there's four questions that they asked to go through the OEI uh, classification, um, but I know Lucy had put up the, uh, the pathway there. So that would be uh, the best place to refer back to probably quickest. Okay. And so what I'm hearing is maybe it's not black and white, right? It's a bit of a decision to deem whether or not you fit in yeah. one category or another. Exactly. Um, when an IP is declared, the first thing that happens is we reach out to, do, out to that person to find out as much about the premise as quickly as possible. And that's where they go through the series of questions based on the number of birds in the flock and what you are doing with them. Thanks. Uh, so here's a question about CFIA working with with municipalities, uh, whether or not they do, particularly for backyard flock registries to identify other flocks that are registered or if a flock owner reports within that municipality. Like, can you just describe if there's integration there? Yeah, I would say we work heavily with industry and our municipalities um, for any identification of flocks, both commercial and non involved in the primary control zone radius. So we are definitely sharing that information. So we're just, uh, just a follow up question, Chris, for your comment about agriculture impacting migratory pathways. Is there more you can elaborate or is it about crop? Yeah, about yeah so it's, it's kind of agricultural, agricultural different agricultural practices. So um, like on a continental scale, a perfect example, snow geese. Snow geese used to leave Hudson Bay and James Bay and fly directly to the Gulf of, of Mexico to feed in the salt salt marshes down there. With rice agriculture, that expansion, expanding north off the coast, that provided a, a, a reliable resources at, resource for snow geese. And then um, we, we also have seen an expansion of corn agriculture and no-till no farming, which, which leaves waste grain on the surface. So it's accessible um, throughout the Higher, whether it's a conscious decision or just survival of the fittest and those birds that are able to take advantage of, of that subsidy. We've, we've seen that the, it's, it's fairly well documented that the change in, in migration and some of these species that can take advantage of agriculture and, and, and no-till farming is a, probably has a big influence on, on that. So that's just one example. Yeah. Thank you. Um... So where can we find more information about what rules apply to falconry? That's probably going to be more of an MNRF question. I think we should probably pass that one on to some of the folks at MNRF. I can, uh, we can reach out to them uh, and see if we can't get an answer for you for next week. Uh, if that works, or you can, this person can uh, email PIC and we'll try and get a contact for them that they can you can talk with all the falconry rules. Okay. Well, Manfred doesn't have much of a role to play in falconry because we don't really eat a lot of falcon. A lot. No, <laughs> any. a lot or any, yes. Linda, I'm just shooting my email over to you through the answer here. Um, yeah, hopefully. Uh, 
so it's just a question about the minister's order preventing the use of education birds being brought to classrooms or outdoor education facilities. Uh, I think it does actually address that as one of the things we wanted to prevent simply because uh, I've had this discussion with some of our, our raptor education centers is that you might bring it to um, a group of people and if some of those people have birds, commercial, backyard, whatever, uh, there is that potential risk for your bird. But it, we do talk about in the order and I'm seeing if I can just find it here. We do talk about the limit and it does include um, for the use of education. Limitation? Can you just say that again? Limit, yeah, limiting limiting words that are being used. I'm just seeing if I can find the actual wording here so I can repeat it. Okay. Uh, see if I can find it in the order. But we do talk, I, I do recall that it does talk about uh, Yeah, birds for, okay. Including all commercial and non-commercial poultry, zoological or other display poultry, birds housed at wildlife rehabilitation facilities or personal pet species. So that who is impacted by the order or by the, that, that can be, get the disease and will be impacted by the order. Okay. Um, you can find the order on our website and you can go through and and well, that so okay. So the, I guess the follow-up question is: birds can't go into classrooms. Um, once again, going back to Cassandra, if those birds are sick and it's been to a classroom, every kid in that classroom who's got birds is going to be now getting a call from CFIA, right? Yep. And so, Al, with something like that, where it's kind of a specific question, that one eight hundred number that goes into OMAFRA, is that a good place to call to get clarifications about some of this stuff? Yes, yeah, because if they can't answer the question, they can get someone who can answer it for you. Okay. Um, because the order itself is, is fairly specific. You know, one of the questions we had was about earlier was about things like one-on-one -on -one sales. That's not addressed by the order. Doesn't mean you should do it, not necessarily. Right. So yeah, further questions can be brought to our, our contact center number, which is uh, 1-877-424-1300. Okay. Um, one, one last comment I want to bring up and that is relation to some of the rodenticides. We had a question about non-target species. Um, some of the second or third gen products uh, don't actually have a lot of uh, activity in the carcass of, of the primary consumer. So that deals with some of the issues about uh, wild bird species or raptors picking up some of these deads, but those birds are, sorry, that product is very um, deadly to the first consumer of it. So once again, that goes back down to using proper uh, baiting so that we don't end up having um, non-target species consume that product. Like baiting or bait stations or lockable bait stations that can't be accessed by on target species. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Feel free to pop them in. Heather, I'm gonna put you on the spot and, and give you the podium and say, what do you want us to take away from what we learned from you tonight? Get the flu shot. Get your and, flu and shot. Get your flu shot and be, thoughtful with your with your personal protective equipment and try and keep your distance um no birds in the house please uh unless they're pet birds uh that are intended to be in the house yeah, but right. we don't need we don't need house canada geese so right right chris <laughs> actually that, that's a good point though because i've been talking with some of the pet bird folks and they're looking in the future planning as i know some of uh, some other groups have had is everything from planning of events and and will you be caught in another order in the future so are we going to see this in your in in the spring in the fall again next year i don't know chris my guess is yes i mean the the european experience this has been going around it's it's i think starting in the third year 
So um, that's not comforting news by any means for anyone that's on this call. Um, but it's the reality. It's I I, I don't I don't think that uh, it, it's it's going anywhere uh, soon, unfortunately. Yeah. So that being said, we've got some of the groups that I've been dealing with have been looking at changing events to times when there's less risk, right? So getting away from the spring and fall migrations if you're going to have expos, um, you know, some of these events where birds are going to be brought together to try and avoid that opportunity or the chance um because i get it some some of the folks we deal with the the shows and expos and events are part of the hobby and need to happen for that, for that to continue but uh putting them into october november when we're probably going to be in the same situation again next year is uh probably not great so events are being moved to low risk times uh and i guess what is a low risk time that's looking probably summer or past fall migration, but uh, Chris didn't give me a whole lot to be comforted about a couple of weeks ago when you said some of those birds you were concerned about over winter in Ontario. Yeah, I, well, I, I think you always have to be vigilant. I, I don't know, I don't know what else to say really and, and be careful and kind of do, do the best you can. Yep, stay safe. Okay, so I just want to give a special thanks to Heather and Al for presentations and Cassandra and Chris for joining again to provide their expertise and insights. And thanks to all of you for tuning in tonight. Uh, next week, we have a couple different things that we're going to cover to be confirmed. So if you're interested, just check the Poultry Industry Council website and we'll have that posted as soon as we can get things sorted out. But otherwise, we'll see you again soon.